Welcome back to our lecture on U.S. history. Today what we're going to be looking at is new governments that are created in the United States from 1776 to 1787. This will be composed mostly of state governments that were created at the start of the revolution and the national government, the Articles of Confederation. What we see on this slide is a, a political cartoon of Shays' Rebellion, and we're going to talk about how it kind of fits into this time period as we go through. So the spirit of 76, let's start there. This is an idea of what we call the evolutionary, revolutionary ethos. In other words, what were people thinking about when the revolution was going on? What were they talking about? What were they debating about? And basically, it's the enlightenment in the United States. People were talking about, and liberal means it changed, right? And so people are talking about the words of equality, opportunity, freedom, democracy, all of these things that are, of course, part of the American ethos or way of thinking or culture today, they really found their expression here during the revolution. Because the revolution is supposed to be about, you know, creating independence from England, and we're upset that we had taxation without representation, um, and we thought our rights had been violated. And so the United States Revolution is very much an Enlightenment revolution, and those Enlightenment thoughts found their expression in something called the Spirit of 76, all of these ideas kind of percolating together. So we've talked about a lot of these things. Let's talk about a few that we haven't. And so there's this idea of no more deference in America, which means that Americans believe that we're the land of a meritocracy, that in America we don't have to pay respects to people because of how they were born, how they inherited power, whether that be a king or a noble. In America, everybody's a fresh start. We have no nobility. Um, everybody has opportunity to go as far as their talents and their drive will take them. And that's very democratic because anybody can make a success of themselves, not just the people who are born into it. So that's kind of how that fits into this time period. In addition to that, we have this liberal ideology of, at this time, liberal, classical liberalism, of limited government. You know, people in the Enlightenment thought that all government is bad because in any government, the people who have power oppress the people that don't have the power. And so, you know, we have to obviously have government or else we have chaos and anarchy. And so the best kind of government, if we have to have it, is very small government without much power over our lives and it should be a democracy where the people control the people and not some small group of uh, inherited rulers, not some small group of really rich oligarchs, but the people themselves. And so if we're going to have a government, make it a democracy and make it so that it's small and weak and can't tell us what to do. Um, give government some power, but very little. So all of these were examples of the spirit of 76. Right? So to what degree did the spirit of 76 apply to other groups besides white men? Did it apply to women, slaves, poor white men? And the answer in all areas is not really, no. Um, when we talk about giving rights and freedom to people and the right to vote and the right to run for office and to have civil liberties, that was mostly for property-owning white men. Um, if you were a poor man, we didn't think your voice was should be heard because you don't pay a lot of taxes, so why should you have a say in the government? Um, if you were a slave... Barbados Slave Code said that you were a piece of property, so not a human being, and so you shouldn't have a right in the government. If you're a woman, except for the state of New Jersey for a brief period of time, the revolution did not let women have more rights, um, and so we see that, yeah, women are excluded too. So at this time, these Enlightenment ideas of the Spirit in 76, like I said, really only apply to property-owning white men. So that gets us to the question of, well, well, how revolutionary was the revolution? Did the revolution, because revolution means sudden change, right? So did the revolution really change anything? So let's do a before and after, kind of a change over time, if you will. The red on this map shows, or on this chart, shows that people who can vote. And so before the revolution, whether you're in the south with the plantation elite or the north with the merchant elite, um, they are at the top. They're the smallest group of society at the top. They have the most power. They're the smallest in number, but they have the most wealth. And then when we go down the social status, we have farmers and artisans, farmers who have a decent amount of land um, so they can vote. They have property. Or artisans who have a decent amount of wealth. They have a shop and they have some money so they can vote. We feel that people who have money have a stake in society because they pay taxes and so they should have some say in what the government does with those taxes. Then further down we see people that are in, that are in this black littering here who don't have enough property to really pay a lot of taxes. Poor white people. These are people with a very small farms, maybe on the frontier, or people that are landlessly 
laborers, right? Um, and so since they don't have much property, they don't pay many taxes. So why should they get to tell the people who do pay more taxes what to do? Um, and so we don't let them have the right to vote before the revolution. And of course, slaves as well. Slaves aren't even considered people at this time legally. Um, and so they don't have the right to vote. So this is pre-revolutionary America. Some democracy not a lot of democracy. And so now let's go to post-revolutionary America, right? And I'm going to talk about this guy on the guillotine in just a second, right? And so if we look here, after the revolution, the elite are still on top, right? Unlike the French Revolution, where the poor rose up and overthrew the elite and killed them, we don't have that in America. Our revolution was not a social revolution. It was a political revolution for the most part. We were, you know, rebelling against a faraway authority that was trying to tell us what to do. It wasn't the poor class trying to rise up and kill and, you know, destroy the rich class. Now, there is some upward pressure for the rich class to make some accommodations and some more democracy. And we're going to talk about that in future slides. But there's not going to be this violent turn the triangle upside down kind of revolution that we may have seen in France or Haiti. All right? And so the elites still have power, the elites still vote. Um, farmers that have land and artisans that have property still are able to vote. Poor white people, we're not going to still let them vote. Um, and so we talked about more democracy in the revolution, spirit of 76, but it still didn't let poor white people vote. And of course, we didn't get rid of slavery in much of this in the South. And um, we'll talk about where it did go away in other places. Now, if you look closely, though, right, so there is no kind of broad class warfare in French Revolution here in America. But if we look closer, there are two slight changes here that the revolution did make happen. First of all, a lot of the elite were loyalists, right? People who the uh, pre-revolutionary America was working for them, whether they were governors or there were people that did business with English uh, merchants, and so they stayed loyal to the crown, and we know what happened to loyalists during the revolution. They were forced out and discriminated against and persecuted, and so a lot of them left. And so in some small way, there was uh, some class change, right? Because we are getting rid of some elite, but the patriot elite are still on top, right? So that didn't change. In addition to that, if you look closely, the property requirement line from over here, it did get lowered in a lot of states. And so we're not going to let all poor white men vote, but we are going to kind of lower the threshold of having enough wealth or land to vote. Because one, that was the spirit of 76, with more democracy, and so we kind of look hypocritical if we don't do that. And two, if I'm an elite person who wants the revolution, and I want people to join the army, I want people to support the boycotts, I have to give the poor people some incentive. And so I have to say to them, we're going to give more democracy to the people that don't have it. And so that was kind of a reason for lowering property requirements to get um, poor people, um, the top end of the poor people, to feel like they have some stake in this revolution and to join it. And so we do see kind of a more sophisticated way of looking at this. We do see some social change and some political change, um, but not radical like we saw, like I said, in Haiti and France. All right, um, so more democracy for white men, if we want to boil it down to it, for some white men. All right, now what about women? And so on the last slide, we had said that women aren't going to get much change, and they don't, right? New Jersey quickly says, oh, what were we doing? And they take away the right from women to vote again. Um, but women, at least, did get some social respect. Um, we had talked about this on our last lectures. Um, the idea of Republican motherhood pops up as a result of the spirit of 76. That if we're going to have a country with democracy where the people as defined as we've defined that where the people get to vote then we need to make sure that our future voters are decent moral people that are well educated or else we're going to be it's dangerous to put you know, power to vote in their hands um, and so who's the most responsible for raising virtuous educated young men moms and so at this point we say look even though we don't respect women enough to give them the right to vote we do respect you enough in your role as mothers of boys to you know say a girl <laughs> right way to go we need you're important your job of raising sons is important and we respect you for that and so it's respect for their traditional domestic role that's something um, that is a change but it's not drastic change right we're not giving women the right to vote and we're not letting them hold office all right, so now let's start talking about some new state constitutions. So as soon as we declare independence, we don't have 13 colonies anymore. We have 13 new states. 
Um, and so each colony did have a constitution, um, a, a set of rules that they, that they ran their government by. And of course, we have to throw that away because that's when we were colonies of the king and we had a colonial governor that was appointed by the king. And we're not colonies anymore. We've declared our independence. And so we need to create a whole new constitution for our independent state. And so we're going to see all 13 colonies, um, you know, write new constitutions. What are some things these constitutions all have in common? I mean, there's 13 different ones, um, but for the most part, they're all republics. They're all going to have elected people make decisions for the people. And so that's something they all have in common. Um, we're also going to see that a lot of these states are going to lower property requirements to vote, which we've said. But they're also going to do something else more democratic, is they're going to get rid of primogenitor laws. So let's do a change over time. So in the colonies, just like back in Europe, we had primogenitor. Primo means first, right? primo. And so in the past, when a dad had, let's say, four sons, when he died, all of his wealth went to his oldest son. All of his land, all of his property, his shop if he's an artisan, his farm if he's a farmer, everything. And the other three sons, well, so sorry, you're not the firstborn son, you don't get anything. Um, and so that's not very democratic, is it? Right? These other sons, they don't have any land, they can't vote because they have no property, so they have no control over the government, and it's very hard for them to get married because, you know, you wanted to make sure that if you let your daughter get married, that she could get married to a husband that could support her because he has property. And so these people didn't have the best of lives. And so that's not very democratic. Not everybody is getting a chance. And so in these new state constitutions, we got rid of primogenitor laws, which are now allowed the dad to divide his property up equally, if he so choose, among his descendants, his sons. And we can see now that more people have access to more land. If they have access to more land and we lower the property voting requirement, more men can vote, more democracy. And so this is an example of democracy growing in these new state constitutions. Now let's go to another example of more democracy, is that we're going to see a whole bunch of states move their capital from the coast further inland, from like Pennsylvania to Harrisburg, right? Um, from Savannah to Atlanta later on, um, those kinds of things. And so what we see is, if you look at this map, we see that the capitals in many states are moving west. Well, how is this more democratic and why are they doing it? Well, because in the past, let's just draw a picture here. Here's the coast, here's the ocean, right, ocean. Um, and so here was the capital city, and that was dominated by the elite, the people that were on the coast that could trade with England or France or Spain that had the money in Virginia, it's where all the members of the House of Burgesses, um, they were all rich, white, powerful men, and they were living near the capital so they could get to the capital. And if you had these poor people out on the frontier... They don't have a lot of land, and even if they can vote um, and hold office, it's really hard for them to come all the way here to the state capital, because roads back then were atrocious, um, and so they really didn't participate um, in the government, because the government was so far away from them. And so as we're writing new state constitutions, in part to get the poor people to support the revolution, we're saying, look, we're going to be more democratic. We're going to move the capital to you, the poor people on the frontier. Now more people can participate in the government, can vote, can go and serve in office. And so this is an example of more democracy as a result of the revolution. Next, even though it's covered up a little bit here, we're getting rid of established churches. In some colonies, every colony had an official tax-supported church. Like if you're in Massachusetts, it's the Congregationalist Church, which is a, a descendant of the, of the Puritan Church. If you were in Virginia, it was the Anglican Church. It was the Church of England. Um, and even if you didn't belong to the church, you had to pay money to the church to support it. And that's not very democratic to have to pay taxes to, so, to support a church you don't even belong to or believe in. And so during the revolution, we're seeing a, these states are going to start to drop their established tax-supported churches because that's not democratic. And so we see that now we're getting more secular governments. We're separating church and state, where if you were in Virginia, there is no official church anymore, so you don't have to give money to the Anglican church. Um, if you're in Massachusetts, same thing with the Congregationalist church. And so this is more fair to people because now your money can go to the church you choose to go to or no church at all. Um, and so this is much more democratic as well, right? Um, so now we have, it says, many states create new constitutions with most of the local power in the legislative branch. So I had said that a lot of these states are doing these things that I've been describing, and a lot of these state constitutions were a republic. They elect people to represent them. And also, um, so more power to the people. But also, 
you think of the time, let's contextualize, when these new state constitutions were being created, we're right at the start of the revolution, and we're, we're, we're fighting a revolution against an oppressive, far-off government that can tell us what to do. So if we're going to make a new state constitution in this time frame, it makes sense that we're going to have a very limited government, that the new state constitution we create is not going to be big and powerful like the parliament and the king was. It's going to be very small, and it's going to give most of the power back to the people. Um, it's going to be very democratic. And so we're not even, in some states, we don't even have an executive branch. There's not even a governor. And if there is a governor in some states, he has almost no power. All the power resides in the people's branch, the legislative branch, the branch that we directly elect and they sure serve short one-year terms and so if we don't like the taxes that Pennsylvania's new government is passing on Pennsylvania we can quickly get rid of them by voting them out of office in a year um, instead of four years or six-year terms or life terms right and so we're going to try to put handcuffs on the new government to make them intentionally weak so that they can't control us and so we see that happening here in all of these states Right. So more examples of democracy going and growing. And so in the northern states, the states that are north, and this is an important distinction right here, this line right here that separates Maryland from Pennsylvania is called the Mason-Dixon line. And it's not important just because it separates Pennsylvania from Maryland. It also is the symbolic separation between north, right? Um, and south, um, because this is just happened to be where the climate gets warm enough and long enough to grow cash crops. A little bit north of this line, you grow cereal crops. South of this line, you grow cash crops. And of course, cash crop farming means slavery at this point. Um, and so that kind of separates the north from the south. And so in the states north of the Mason-Dixon line, the middle and the northern colonies, now states, we're going to see as part of the spirit of 76, to get rid of slavery. And so all of the states north of that line are eventually, some right away and some eventually, are going to outlaw slavery. It will be called abolition, to abolish or get rid of slavery. And because it seems, it seems hypocritical otherwise, if we're saying that this revolution is for the spirit of 76, um, it's for freedom, democracy, liberty, equality, um, then that means slaves too. And the North can do this because they don't have a lot of slaves, so it's not really gonna harm their economy to all of a sudden free slaves. Um, however, in the South, that's not going to happen. We're gonna, not going to see a single southern state south of the Mason-Dixon line free their slaves because they've invested too much money in the slaves. They've bought those slaves, right? I mean, if we just free them, then all that money just walks out the door and it'll destroy our economy. Who's going to pick the cotton or who's going to harvest the rice? Um, no, 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 no. We're not going to do this. And so we see a definite split here happening in this new country. All right. So who are leading these abolition movements up north? Well, in Pennsylvania, it's the Quakers, not surprisingly, the Society of Friends. They believe that we're all equal in the eyes of God and that everybody should have opportunity and everybody should be loved equally. Um, and so they're like, yes, yeah, slavery is wrong. Let's get rid of it. And so the first anti-slavery societies were created by the Quakers in 1775, even before the revolution. Ben Franklin right here was one of the people who helped found the society. All right, so is there any kind of national movement to get rid of slavery? Hmm. And the answer is no, right? We've talked about it. That if, they, if we're going to talk about the national government called the Articles of Confederation, but they're not going to approach. They're not going to get rid of slavery at the national level. The state level, okay, depends where you are. But the national level, uh, uh, because if you were to tell the South, look, be part of our new nation, you have to get rid of slavery. The South said, well, we're not going to be part of your nation then. It's just that important to us. Um, and so the government did not address slavery na na nationwide, just at the state level. All right, and so that's the, state, the new state constitutions, as much as we need to know about them. Let's now talk about the national government. Um, and this national government was created by a document called the Articles of Confederation. And really, the importance of the name cannot be understated here is the confederation. A confederation is classically defined as a loose organization of states or governments that temporarily come together for some common mutual need. That is not a strong national government. That is a weak national government. And it was purposely created at this time for the same reason the states created weak central governments in that state level, right? And the Articles of Confederation are written as soon as we declare independence in 1776 um, to create a national government for these 13 new states. Um, and so they purposely chose a confederation because these states, these 13 states, have very different histories, different economies, different views on slavery, different views on religion. Um, and they're only really coming together 
um, to get rid of England and all the bad things she's done to us. And so Confederation seems perfect, right? We don't want to recreate a strong national government right when we're trying to get rid of a strong national government of England. And so they purposely made the government very weak, very limited, so it wouldn't take away the people's rights, and a confederation. And the implication is that this is just a maybe a temporary government um, to help us get through the revolution, and then after the revolution is over, we'll see if we want to stay together. There was no expectation of a long-term union of states at this point among many people. Right? So the Confederation is written in 1776. It was meant to be our national government to get us through the revolution. But it's actually not going to go into effect until 1781. Right? So five years later, it's going to be delayed. So that means during most of the revolution, this is not our national government. It's waiting in the wings. It's ready to go. Um, but we have to kind of, um, you know, kind of just muddle through the Second Continental Congress that didn't have any power anyway. Um, and so, but eventually in 1781, it is ratified. I mean, it becomes our first national government as a country. Um, so why the delay? I mean, certainly we needed a national government when we're fighting a revolution against the king. We need to come together and raise taxes or make laws or try to figure out how to organize our troops. There's a need for it. So what was the delay? And the delay was out here in these western lands, right? All of these different states claimed land out west, west of the, this is the Appalachian Mountains, west of the Appalachian Mountains. But the problem is they have competing claims. Like this big chunk right here that is this color that we see, New York and Virginia are both claiming all of this land. They say that as a colony, they had a right to it. So as a state, they have a right to it, right? Massachusetts, way over here, was claiming all of this land, also trans-Appalachians. Um, and so all of Connecticut, little Connecticut is claiming all of this land, same and down in the south. And so when we say, oh, let's have a national government, the states are like, well, okay, before we do that, Who's going to own this land out west? Because we say we own it, and you say you own it, and we are not going to we're not going to ratify the the Articles of Confederation until we settle this dispute about lands out west. And it takes them five long years to figure out what to do because this land out west means money, right? If whoever owns it can sell it to future farmers and make money for their state, and let's contextualize at this time. All of the states are kind of separately fighting the revolution, um, and all of them have had to borrow money and raise taxes, and they're going into debt to fight the revolution. So when the revolution's over, they could get out of debt by selling off some of this western land. And so, yeah, they don't want to compromise on giving up this land. But eventually, things get so dire during the revolution that it's clear that the Second Continental Congress is not a good way to run the country during a revolutionary war, as they eventually decide, okay, let's come up with an agreement. If, no, if, if I can't own the land, then nobody can own the land. And so they all, what we call seed, give up the land to the new national government. And once they decide to do that, the last stumbling block for this constitution is done. And so they ratify the new Articles of Confederation in 1781. So let's talk about the accomplishments. What good happened to the United States of America when they had the Articles of Confederation as their government? There's just a couple of things, and they all deal with land out west. Um, one, it's a good thing already, is that this need for the Articles of Confederation kind of forced the states to stop bickering and give up the land. And so that kind of was an indirect positive of the Articles of Confederation. Um, but let's now talk about uh, another actual physical tangible accomplishment. In 1785, well after the revolution, um, we are going to send out surveyors to the west to, to survey it, to divide up the land so it makes it easier to sell. Now the surveyors went up here. Now this whole area up here is called the Northwest Territory. Down here it's the Southwest Territory. And so we're going to be talking about the Northwest Territory. So the, under the Articles of Confederation, the states passed the Land Ordinance of 1785. It says that we're going to send surveyors out west. The national government is going to send surveyors out west. And they're going to survey the land in easy to understand squares. And those squares will be divided into more squares. And their squares will be divided into more squares and so on and so on until you get to a small square that's about 160 acres. Which at this time, with the climate of the this part of the United States, is enough land and water, enough water and enough vegetation to actually support a small family um, and to grow crops. And so we see that that's, now we have the land. And so if I want to move west and I want to buy a piece of land, it's very easy to sell the land, to buy the land, and we know who owns the land because it's been surveyed in these nice 
you know, grid lines of longitude and latitude, and there it is, right? Um, and so this is a gonna this is going to thing that's going to be make it really easy for people to move west and settle the Northwest Territory. Now the same thing cannot be said for the Southwest. The land ordinance of 1785 only dealt with the Northwest, not the Southwest. And so in the Southwest, people will move west. It's just going to be very hard to do because not only are there natives out there that we're going to have to kill um, and get rid of if you're a white person, but um, there it's kind of the wild west at this point that we're going to have a whole bunch of people saying, I own this piece of land. No, I own this piece of land. And they can't decide where their land begins and everybody else's ends because it wasn't surveyed. The, this land ordinance only deals with the northwest. And so we're going to see kind of a tumultuous, wild southwest um, that we'll talk about in the future. Future. But it is an accomplishment. It does, it does help us settle the Northwest easier. All right. The next thing the Land Ordinance of 1785 does is it, it says we value education up here in the North. Um, and so as we move West, one uh, one of these pieces of squares, right, one section of it, whatever we sell, the money is not going to go to the national government. Um, it's going to go to the local government out West, and they're going to use that money to make a school. Um, and so we see public education moving west um, from the north to the northwest. And we've talked about in previous lectures how important public education was to the Puritans in New England. And so that's just part of their culture. And so they said as their grandchildren and great-grandchildren start to move west from the first pilgrims and Puritans, they're going to bring the importance of education with them. And we can see that here. And so we see an education system move to the south to the northwest. Again, the same is not true for the southwest. Um, the land ordinance does not apply to the south. Southwest. Um, and so when people move west, well, they don't have a tradition of having public schools in the south. And so when they move to Mississippi and Alabama and Tennessee, they're not going to make a lot of public schools because they don't have this funding system put in place. And so we, I, I'm trying to make the point that already, right, from this and what we said before about slavery, we're starting to see two Americas developing quickly, a Northern America and a Southern America. And we'll just continue deepening that division as we go through this course. All right. Um, next, now, here's another accomplishment of the Articles of Confederation, and it's the more well-known one. It's the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. So in 1787, it's, again, well past the, the Revolution, um, and this is something that the Articles of Confederation got right. Um, and so as we start to rapidly move west, um, the English are gone from the west, and we can move west, um, we start to see people settle, and in the north it's easy to set up towns, and it's easy to set up farms, um, because, you know, we've surveyed it, and we see little schools being created that makes it a nice place to go and so before you know it we have a lot of people in Ohio and Indiana and Michigan and they're like hey we have enough people we should not be a colony of the United States we should be a state of the United States um, and so like why do we not get to send people to Congress to make decisions for us that is only the 13 states on the East Coast um, there's nothing in the Articles of Confederation so far about people moving west and creating new states um, and so we see here that there was starting to be a lot of east-west friction in the United States because the East Coast had all the 13 states and they controlled Congress and they could make decisions and laws. But the new people that were move, the people that were into the moving to the new areas of the Northwest, like, well, we're American citizens. We should have the right to send people to Congress. And so, are you just treating us as a colony? I thought we fought a we recently fought a revolution to get rid of some far off government telling us what to do. And so they had to reach some kind of an agreement. They had to figure out a plan to add new states, or else risk an East West civil war. Um, and so that's what the Northwest Ordinance does. It says that when enough people move into an area out west, it'll be called a territory. And that territory will have their own government, um, and, and, then, and that's great. They'll have their own government so they can have representative democracy. And eventually, that new, if there's even more people that move out there, um, then eventually they'll have enough people to apply for statehood and be on equal footing in Congress with the states that have already existed. And so now we see that the people out west are not as angry because they know there's a path to equality for their state. There's a path to having them having the equal say in the government um, as well as the original 13. Now, maybe if England would have done this and let the colonies have representation in Parliament, that would have avoided the revolution. So maybe we've learned from that. Um, and so now we see we're going to start to add Western states soon, um, and they're going to be treated as equals. And that's part of the North. It's because of the Northwest Ordinance. 
The second thing that the Northwest Ordinance does, and maybe the most famous thing that it does, is it, it figures out the question of slavery. So I had told you, just because of climate, it became traditional out east for um, the northern states to be free and not have slaves. And we see an abolition movement established up there and free the slaves. And then the southern states to keep their slaves. Um, and so we saw this kind of two different approaches to freedom and African Americans and to slavery. But the Mason-Dixon line stops right here in the Appalachian Mountains. It does not go west because Maryland stops, right? And the Mason-Dixon line is just the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania, and it's the unofficial border between slave and free. Well, as we start to add these new states out west, the question is being, well, are these new states going to be free or are they going to be slave? Are they going to say no slavery or are they going to say slavery? And so we have to reach an agreement on that because, um, again, slavery is already develop dividing the country. And so it was pretty easy at this point um, because most of the people that are moving into the Ohio and Indiana are coming from the north where there isn't slaves. So they don't bring slaves with them. Plus the climate in these in this Northwest Territory, it is really too short of a growing season to grow cash crops. Um, and so there's really no reason to have slaves up here. And so the people that were moving into Kentucky and Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama, they have slaves because they're from slave states and they're going to bring them with them. And the climate down here is longer growing season and more hot and humid and we can grow cash crops. And so it's made sense that what we do is we draw a boundary that divides what climate has already divided and migration has already divided. And we're going to make this division the Ohio River. It's this nice natural division that already is dividing areas that are settled by people who don't have slaves and people who do have slaves. And so the Northwest Ordinance says that the Ohio River will now extend the Mason-Dixon line right west. And what we mean by that is instead of just keep drawing that line, we're going to use the Ohio River as a Mason-Dixon line. Right? And so north of the Ohio River, all of these territories will eventually be free states. And south of the Ohio River, all of these ter slave territories will all be slave states. Um, and so, of course, that is a very notable thing that the Northwest Ordinance does. And so those are, those, those are the really two big accomplishments of the Articles of Confederation. That's it. Um, they did deal with a lot of issues out west that we can agree on. But that's about it. So the rest of these notes will talk about how the Articles of Confederation actually worked, how the, the Congress was set up, what powers it did and didn't have, and also its failures. And there are many failures. Um, so let's start with its makeup and powers. H how did people, states, get represented in this new uh, government? And so it was um, equal representation. Um, so what that meant is, is that if you have one state, you have one vote. So if you're the state of Massachusetts, you get to have one vote in Congress. This new body of people, this new lawmaking body under the Articles of Confederation for the nation, Congress. Um, if you're Pennsylvania, you get a vote. If you're New York or Maryland or Virginia or Georgia, you get a vote. Um, and so it seems very equal, very democratic, right? 13 states, 13 votes. Nobody gets to tell the other states what to do. We're fighting a revolution. Remember, they wrote this when we were fighting the revolution. And we don't trust government. Liberal Enlightenment ideology says limited government is the best government. Um, and so, okay, so one state, one vote, and no one state can dominate the others. So this is not based on population. So even if you're Massachusetts with a lot of people and you're Georgia with very few people, you still got equal representation in Congress. So that's not really fair to the big population states, but that was the only thing we can get the states to agree to to come together. Um, now it says unicameral Congress. So unicameral means one, right? Uni means one. And so like today in our government in the United States, we have a bicameral Congress. We have a House and a Senate, two houses. Um, then we just had one because we don't want we don't want any shenanigans here. We just want a very simple, limited government, one state, one vote, and that's it. And if the if you can't get enough states to agree to it, it doesn't pass. All right, so unicameral Congress. Um, now, it says that look, the whole reason we came together is to fight the revolution, and so um, the the continental I'm sorry, the Congress and the Articles of Confederation they said we are here for defense to fight the revolution, and we're here to make sure our trade is better so that we make money, right? Because England was impinging on our trade, and then once the revolution is over, maybe we continue, maybe we don't. We'll see. Right. Now, of course, they did not give this new Congress, this new National Congress under the Articles of Confederation, the power to tax. 
because the power to tax is the power to destroy. It's the power to destroy your life if the government can just reach in any time they want and take money out of your pocket. Um, and so we were very nervous about that, right? Contextualized. At this time that the articles were written, we're fighting against king and England in parliament, and they're taxing us. So there's no way we're going to create a strong new national government to rule us that has the power to tax. And so they don't have the power to raise money which of course is just a horrible thing because governments need money. They have to pay for an army. They have to pay for a navy. They have to build roads. Um, they have to you know, pay for their own operating expenses. Um, but sorry, not going to happen. And so as you can tell, this is going to be a very weak, ineffective government um, because they had no money. And that was the whole point, right? We don't want a strong, powerful government. We want a limited government that can't tell us what to do. And so they purposely put it in here that they didn't have the power to tax. Right? Next, in order to pass a law, you need two-thirds of the 13 states to say yes, which is a very high threshold. It's not a simple majority of 51%. We want to make it difficult. Right? Two-thirds is harder than 51% to get. Um, and so um, we want to make it difficult to pass a law. We want to really make sure everybody is in favor of this. Um, because we are fighting a war right now against England that has um, the power to pass laws on us. And so we don't want to create a new government that can do that. And if they do, it'll be really hard for them to. And so again, here we have this idea of limited government. Right? Next, amending the Constitution, amending the Articles of Confederation is nigh on impossible. Right? It takes a unanimous vote of 13. And you as I both know that it's hard to get 13 people to agree on anything, much less changing so fundament something so fundamental as the Constitution. And so they made it really almost impossible to change the Constitution. Because we have this Constitution, we're comfortable with this Articles of Confederation, it's very limited, we don't trust the government to do anything, and so let's make it hard for it to try to grow in power. Um, and so there you go, unanimous vote. All right. Now, next, so we know we have a legislative branch to make laws, although it's hard to make laws, um, but we have no executive branch, none whatsoever. There's no national president, there's no national governor, um, there's no prime minister, nothing. Um, and that's because, again, think of contextualization. We're creating this constitution when we're fighting against a strong, powerful, what we call abusive king. Um, and so why would we make another one? So no, no executive branch, which means, of course, that no laws are going to be enforced. So even if Congress does pass laws and gets the two-thirds vote, well, it doesn't matter because there's no executive branch to enforce the law. Talk about a weak government that was purposely designed to be so. Next, there's no judicial branch. There's no Supreme Court, right? We don't trust some strong, powerful, far-off government to tell us what to do to enforce the law and to decide if we've broken the law. So just let's not have a court system. And of course, this is a problem because um, if states have disagreements with each other, and they will, there's no court to come in to interpret the law. There's no court to come in and say who's right and who's wrong. And so when you don't have anybody who can act as mother and say you're right and you're wrong, you do this, you do that, then we just resort to violence. And we'll see after the revolution that the states actually start physically fighting each other because there's no other way for them to settle their disputes. There's no peaceful way for them to do that because there's no judicial branch. Right. And so this is just like the point I'm making, right, is that we purposely set up a weak central government because we believe in the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment says limited government. And we purposely set up a weak central government because, you know, we currently were fighting the king and we don't want another king. And so, okay, so in theory, this makes sense. Let's talk about some of the actual problems with it. And so we'll start with external. Um, all right. And so since the United States, when we were a country and we were fighting the revolution, um, we couldn't raise taxes. Um, the Second Continental Congress couldn't raise taxes and then it eventually got replaced by the Articles of Confederation. They couldn't raise taxes and wars were expensive. And so France and Spain and the Dutch were reluctant, but they did lend us money for the revolution because we were fighting a common enemy. And so when the revolution is over, England, France and Spain say, hey, pay up, give us our money. And the new government says, well, okay. And we go and ask the states, hey, would you guys give us some money? We can't make you because we can't pass taxes, but would you give us some money? And the states all say, no, we're not going to do that. We're paying off our own debt from the Revolutionary War, our state debt. We're not going to pay off the national debt. And so we have to go back to England and France and say, sorry, we can't pay off our debt. 
Um, so nobody's going to loan us any more money in the future, which is a problem. Um, and, of course, England, France, and Spain, I'm sorry, France and Spain and the Dutch are going to start punishing us until we pay off our, our debt. And so France just says, fine, you don't want to pay us off? You can no longer trade with Haiti, our French West Indies. Now, this was a big deal for us because if you remember, people down here in South Carolina, they grow rice to the Caribbean to, to you know, sell to the slave owners down there to grow their sugar. And that was a big customer of theirs, the French. And so we see that the southern plantation owners who grow rice are now out of business, right? Um, in addition to that, a lot of I'm the people... I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Sorry, my watch just went off. Um, that's modern technology. Um, and so if you also remember up here in New England, they grew, uh, they had lumber that they could sell to the Caribbean to, uh, you know, use them to burn to make uh, from sugar into molasses or rum. Well, can't trade with them now. The cereal crops were also being used to feed slaves down here that the French had. Sorry, can't do that now. And so the French cutting off their trade to punish us until we pay back their debt is going to have a really bad economic impact on this new country. And we can't do anything about it because our government is too weak. Next, England also cuts off trade with us. Now, this is an even bigger problem because before the revolution, our number one customer for our raw materials was England, either England itself or her colonies in the Caribbean or her colonies someplace else. And now we're totally cut off from the English imperial trade network. Um, and so we, have, we can't sell our raw materials to them. And we also can't sell it to France because they've cut us off too. And the Dutch, because they've cut us off too. Oh, and Spain as well, because they've cut us off too, because we all of them owe them money. And there's just the economy of the United States post-revolution is just spiraling down out of control, and the government is helpless to do anything about it. Right? Now, England is not going to let us trade with her. We're not. She's going to let us sell stuff to them. But they are going to sell their finished goods to us, right? During the revolution, right? Before the, well, before the revolution, the colonies were England's number one customer to buy things that they made in England. And during the revolution, England put up a blockade that said, no, we can't trade with them to hurt us. Well, after the revolution is over, all of these goods, right? All of these goods that England makes that they used to sell to America, well, they've been piling up right, on British docks. And so when the revolution is over, the blockade comes down, and all of a sudden, England just floods American markets with all these cheap English goods. Now, they won't let us sell to them, but they will let us buy from them, which means that the money is all going out of America, right? We're buying stuff from England, so we're going to send them our money, but they're not buying anything from us because England won't let them, and so all our money is leaving, not coming back. And so this is a problem for us. In addition to that, if you are, um, uh, you know, uh, an enterprising businessman in America, and you want to start making shoes or clothes or hats or something, and you want to build up your business, well, now... You know, you can't sell to England because they're not buying from us, and so there's a whole bunch of customers gone. And then in addition, um, if there's an American customer, right? Here's a customer in America. Excuse my bad stick figure. But here's a customer in America, and he's looking for shoes. Well, you would think, well, maybe they'll buy American, right? I'm trying to start this new shoe business. Hey, buy from me. Um, and they won't because England is flooding the American markets with cheap English goods. England has already gone, has already started her Industrial Revolution. America has not. So England is sort of mass producing these cheap English goods. And so if I'm an American consumer, I'm going to buy the cheap, inexpensive English goods rather than the old, than the, the um, American goods that are much more expensive because we haven't started our Industrial Revolution and it's a small company, so they can't mass produce. And so we see American businesses that are trying to get started just go bankrupt, right? Um, and so we see that America is destined to be a poor country that can never develop its own manufacturing because of all these English goods that are coming in. Now today, of course, the United States government today, in present day, has a tool in their, in their government toolbox to use. It's called the tariff. Right? A tariff is a tax on imports. And so whenever we see that American businesses are being hurt by cheap foreign goods, we can put a tax on them, a tariff, and that forces Americans to buy American-made goods that may be a little bit more expensive, but it keeps American workers working. Um, and we'll talk about tariffs and the good and bad side of tariffs in the future, right? Um, but the government can't do this under the Articles of Confederation because they don't have the power to tax. And a tariff is a tax. Um, and so we see that just no way forward. Economically, America is ruined, and it has no way of improving itself. Because the Articles of Confederation, the national government cannot do anything to fix it. 
All right. Um, now, here's another thing. So this is a little bit less of economic history, and let's now go to another reason the Articles of Confederation is failing, is the English never got out of the forts out west. If you remember, the Treaty of Paris said England had to get rid of their forts in the Ohio River Valley. They were there to trade furs with natives. And England obviously does not want to get out of these forts because they're getting rich trading in guns and, and finished goods for the natives for furs. Um, but they're supposed to. This is now American territory. The Treaty of Paris says this is American territory. Everything in green is America now. But the English are like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Sorry. Um, force us. And of course, we have no mili We don't have a military in America because we can't raise taxes, and so we look really foolish here, right? We can't even force England to get out of forts in our own country because we don't have enough money to raise an army to do that to force them to get out. And so England is kind of laughing at us here. All right, next Spain. Right, so we had said that Spain, well, we haven't paid Spain back either from all the debt we owe them from the Revolutionary War, and so Spain is going to punish us. And so they say, one, okay, we're going to sh shut off the port of New Orleans. So here's New Orleans, right? It's a very important port. This is the Ohio River. This is the Mississippi River, and they both go out to the world through the port of New Orleans, right? So there you are. And so if you're a Western farmer in Ohio or, or Indiana or Tennessee or Kentucky, and you want to get your crops to market, let's say you had a good year and you want to sell excess, you cannot go just straight east to sell your crops to Philadelphia or South, South Carolina because there's no roads yet, and the government isn't they can't build any roads because they have no money. And so the cheapest way to get your crops to market was to either float them down the Ohio or the Mississippi and then out through New Orleans. And that way you could get to the East Coast or to the world. Well, of course, Spain is mad at us. And so they cut off all American trade in or out of New Orleans, which means the Mississippi. And this just devastates farmers' economy out west. Um, but once again, what are we going to do? We don't, we don't have enough money to raise an army and a navy to get Spain to stop this. Um, and so this is a problem. Also, Spain has all of these colonies out here. And as America grows west, they're a little afraid that in the future, America may pose a problem and steal some of these colonies. Um, and so Spain is trying to cut off this trade to anger these Western farmers in Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, to, be, to see that they're, you know, they're so angry and they see that their own United States government is so weak that maybe they'll declare their independence or join Spain or create some kind of a buffer state to kind of stop American expansion west. And so pretty devious by Spain, but the United States can't do anything about it because we're too broke. All right, more external problems. So since we can't sell our goods to England, France, Spain, the Dutch, we have to find somebody to buy our raw materials. And so maybe Italy, right? Maybe the Ottoman Empire, maybe Libya, who knows, maybe Egypt. And so we see American merchant ships looking for new customers here in the Mediterranean, trying to maybe sell to Italy, like I said, or maybe the Ottoman Empire, maybe Greece, whatever. And so as our ships go into the Mediterranean, well, of course, there's pirates in the Mediterranean. Um, and so they start attacking our ships. And they can because it's easy pickings, because there's no U.S. Navy to protect U.S. merchant ships. Um, and so this is really easy. Now, other countries deal with this by either protecting their own merchant ships with a British Navy or an, a Spanish Navy, um, so the pirates know not to mess with them, or they just pay the pirates protection money. They're like, look, we don't have a big enough navy here. Leave our ships alone. Here's some money. The United States can't do either because we don't have enough money for a navy and we don't have enough money for protection money. And so again, the United States looks just weak and silly on the international stage. All right. So that's all our external problems. Let's finish it up by talking about internal problems. And so what is going on inside the United States that the Articles of Confederation and Congress cannot deal with? Well, we don't really have, in many areas, official state borders. Both um, Pennsylvania and New York are claiming that this area right here um, is both of theirs. Um, and so, and of course, land means money, as we've said. And so New York and Pennsylvania start arguing with each other over who owns this land. And since there's no Supreme Court, there's no judicial branch, they start actually fighting each other over the land. And this happens between many um, states, right? And so we see now states are fighting each other. And so there's internal chaos going on, and the Articles of Confederation can't solve it because we have no judicial branch, right? Next, the, the economy stagnates. We've talked about internationally why the economy is bad, 
but you know states cannot even sell to each other and exchange trade. So if I make shoes in Massachusetts and I want to sell them to customers in Connecticut, well, there is a, a shoe artist in Connecticut who doesn't want the competition. And so he gets his state to put up a tariff. So states could pass tariffs, but the national government couldn't. And so that's a tax when it crosses a border. And so if I'm selling shoes from Massachusetts into Connecticut, well, now we assess a, a tax at the border. And so now nobody in Connecticut is going to buy those Massachusetts shoes. And so really, interstate trade just shuts down. Um, and so now we see that we have internal reasons for economic downfall. All right. Um, we've already talked about the West Indies. And so now let's talk about farmers. So I've been talking about artisans a lot lately, but let's not talk about farmers because most of the people in America, 90 plus percent of them are farmers. And so, you know, what we see here is that farmers are growing food and growing food and growing food because that's the only way they make money, right? They grow more food. And so they can't grow, they can't sell their food to England because England has cut us off. They can't sell their food to the Caribbean because England, Spain, the Dutch have cut us off, et cetera, et cetera. And so every year the farmers fall into more and more debt, right? They've borrowed money from a bank or some rich person to, to buy land and to buy a plow and horses and a barn, right? And so now they have to pay it back. But the only way farmers can make enough money to pay it back is to grow more food. And they can't do that because there's this glut, this surplus of food. And so when you have a surplus of anything, the prices drop. And so every year it's this downward spiral. And we're going to see this again and again in American history. Farmers go into debt to be a farmer. They have to raise food to pay off the debt. All the farmers are raising food to pay off the debt. So there's a surplus of food. So now it's the second year. So now we're even more in debt and the bank is getting even angrier. And so the only way to pay off the debt and your growing debt is to grow more food. And then food prices go down even more. And so every year food prices go down and down and down. And farmers get into more and more debt with no way to pay it off. And so farmers start losing their farms, right, to banks and to rich people. And this is what we're going to see is going to create a lot of east-west tension. Easterners are the bankers, the people who are rich. The westerners are the poor farmers. And they're getting angry that they're losing their livelihood and their children are starving. And something has to be done about this. So that gets us to Shays' Rebellion. Right? So nice segue. So Shays' Rebellion is going to be an internal rebellion within the state of Massachusetts. It happens from 1786 to 1787. That is a date range to know. Right? And so it starts with this farming problem we've talked about. Right? Um, and so here we have farmers in western Massachusetts. These are where the poor farmers live. They're the new farmers that not too long ago created their farms. Out here on the east coast we have the bankers. Right? Also, we have the rich merchants. Um, and so this is where all the money is in Massachusetts. And they control the government. They have most of the say in what's going on. Right? Now, in Massachusetts, they, have, they had to fight the revolution as well as everybody else. And so they have a lot of debts to pay as a state. And so the only way to pay off debt, there's three ways to pay off debt. You can borrow more money. But nobody's going to lend anybody in the United States money because, you know, we have a bad credit rating. Or you can print money. Um, to pay off a debt. And so, you know, okay, so let's print money. But if you print money, um, that makes the value of your money go down because there's just so much of it. Um, and so, you know, the rich elite people, the bankers and the elite people, they don't want to print more money because bankers, they've loaned out money. And if we all of a sudden print more money, that means when anybody pays the money back, it's going to be in less value. Um, and so if I loan out silver money, and Massachusetts decides to pay off their revolutionary debt by just printing paper money, then all my people who have borrowed money from me are going to start paying their money back in paper money and not silver money. And that's worthless money. And so the bankers of the East Coast were like, no, 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 no. We are not going to pay off our debt as Massachusetts people by printing paper money. Not going to happen. And now the people out West, the farmers, are like, yeah, yeah, I love paper money, right? Because... Right? If I borrowed silver money from the bank, and all of a sudden the government of Massachusetts says we're paying off our debts as a state by printing paper money, now there's all of this paper money in circulation. And that paper money is worthless. And so even though I borrowed $100 of silver money, now the state of Massachusetts says this money is real, and so I can pay the bank back in worthless $100 of paper money, which is great for me. It's easy to get out of debt because I'm using worthless money. And so there becomes this argument inside of Massachusetts between Eastern elite want to still stay with hard specie, which is what we call silver gold currency, 
right? Because it has more value. And then people out west who are struggling to survive, who are struggling to keep their farms, they want the state to start using paper money. And so here we have this definite split inside of Massachusetts, and this is going on in many states. It just happens to come to a head first in Massachusetts between East Coast elite who want to have currency, specie currency, and West Coast and Western farmers who want to have paper money. And so this becomes a major problem. Next, another uh, cause of Shays' Rebellion. So we have this internal conflict over what kind of currency to have. Um, and the East Coast is not listening, and the East Coast controls the government. Um, is we also have to pay off our debt. And so since we're not going to just print money to pay off our debt, we decide to raise taxes. Um, and so in Massachusetts, they start raising taxes to pay off the Revolutionary War debt. And of course, farmers don't have any money. We've talked about how farmers cannot pay the bank back because they can't, they have a surplus of farm goods. And so that's a problem. They're losing their money. They're losing their farms to bankers. But at the same time, the government comes a knocking and says, oh, by the way, you owe us taxes. And it has to be in specie. It has to be in gold or silver coin. And farmers are like, I can't do that. And so farmers are losing their farms either to the bank or to the government because they can't pay off the taxes. And eventually, you just push us too far. You know, we lose our farms. We can't pay our children. We can't feed our children. Uh, we don't have a house to live in. And so it's either die or rebel. Um, and so, of course, they decide to rebel, right? Um, and so the leader of this rebellion um, is named Daniel Shays. And so Daniel Shays is going, he looks around and he sees all of these farmers struggling. Um, he sees that they can't pay, you know, can't sell their crops. They can't pay off their debts to, to the banks. They can't pay off their taxes. And they're losing their farms. And he says, enough already. And so he leads a group of followers and they shut down county courtrooms. Um, they say, you're not going to foreclose on these. You're not going to take away foreclose these farms anymore, the government, because they can't pay their taxes. And they go to the banks and they say, you can't. We're going to burn down the banks, right? We're going to shut down the banks because you're foreclosing on farmers for not being able to pay off their loans. And while we're at it, let's burn down the capital. Um, and so we see this is a lower class rebellion of poor people rising up against the rich eastern elite because they feel the eastern elite have all the power and all the money and they're not listening to them. And so here's another revolution, but this time it's a class revolution. And so that's Shay's Rebellion. So um, obviously the rich people in, in Massachusetts are like, oh no, what are we going to do? We're going to lose all our land, all our businesses, all our banks, all our money, maybe our lives. And so they write a desperate plea to the national government, Congress, please send troops to Massachusetts. We need help. And of course, Congress has to say, yeah, we, we feel for you, but we can't do that um, because we don't have any money. So we can't raise an army to protect the rich people. Um, and so we see that this rebellion is so notable, not just because it points out the poor economy of America after the revolution and the East-West tension, um, but it also points out the weakness of our national government. It cannot even put down internal rebellions. And this becomes really evident among rich people, not just in Massachusetts, but all up and down the coast of the United States, right? Because they figure if it could happen in Massachusetts, it could happen in Virginia or Georgia or Pennsylvania. And so it becomes this big a movement among rich people that we need to fix the Articles of Confederation. We need to make them so they're stronger, so we can raise money, so we can start to, so we can keep peace and order in America, or at least protect the rich, if you want to look at it that way. Um, keep and you know maybe stall some of these problems while we're at it. Um, not being able to protect American commerce, not being able to protect Americans from pirates, settling state disputes. Right? It just all comes to a head. All of these problems. Shays Rebellion just shows us that we need to fix this. Now. Side note, Shays' Rebellion ends when the rich people in Massachusetts convince enough people to raise, to kind of pool their own resources, to raise an army to put down the rebellion, and the rebellion is squashed, but not before it really concerns a lot of people in America about just the chaos that is going on under the Articles of Confederation. So, let's do our learning objectives. These are the things to kind of take away from this lecture. In what ways did the revolution expand democracy to more white people and slaves? And slaves? Well, so it does expand democracy, the revolution to slaves, because remember, we did say that there were some abolition movements inspired by the revolution in the northern states, not the southern states. Um, as far as white people go, we talked about all kinds of things that the new state constitutions were doing to give more white people, men, the right to vote. We lowered property requirements. We moved state capitals west to be more closer to the people. We got rid of primogeniture laws. Those are the kind of things we're talking about. 
Number two, in what ways did the revolution not increase democracy to white people? Well, it didn't get rid of property requirements, so not all white men could vote. It didn't say Native Americans could vote or women, and it certainly didn't end slavery everywhere. Um, and so, you know, and it didn't give African Americans who were set free the right to vote. Um, and so we see there are certainly limits to these Enlightenment spirit of 76 ideas in America. Explain why the, col the colonies created a weak central government. We said contextualization, right? When the Articles of Confederation were written, we have a strong national government, king in England, that we're rebelling against. So why would create a new constitution that creates a new strong national government here? No, we're not going to do that, right? And said give examples of its failures. And we talked about internal failures and external failures um, through the last few slides. All right. Describe the accomplishments of the articles uh, of the government under the Articles of Confederation. And we had said it was mostly on the frontier. The Land Ordinance of 1785, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. These are some rare examples of the Congress under the Articles of Confederation actually able to get stuff done. And that ends our lecture.